poppy youtube we back with another video y'all already know what it is it's your boy jacoby so funny before we get into today's video please like comment subscribe come on man y'all already watching the video like if you fuck with your boy and subscribe so y'all can see more of the video wow i always gotta get on this motherfucker and be telling y'all what to do bro y'all already know what to do bro help a brother out bro come on man we, i got bills i got I got baby mamas I gotta pay. I got child support. I got a wife. I got a girlfriend on the side. I got all that stuff. Help a brother. <laughs> We're gonna get right to the video, bro. Y'all already know what's going on. Like, comment, subscribe. Today we got a big one, big one, big one. Y'all been asking me about this. Y'all already know I've been in my NBA young boy bag for a long time. I got a few more people that I will be making series of. So don't just think the channel is just gonna be NBA young boy all day. But guess what? That's all I've been doing. Y'all been liking it. I've been looking at the, 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 you know, my, I've been looking at my videos and stuff like that. Views been going up because of NBA Young Boy. So I want to sit here and give a huge thank to NBA Young Boy and his fans. Say thank y'all for what y'all been doing. Y'all been watching my content. Y'all been fucking my content. I fucks with y'all. I, I, I'm never going to forget y'all. But guess what? I will be going into different directions. Also, not giving up on my NBA Young Boy content. Not not too fast. Not too fast. Because I fuck with y'all and y'all the first community to fuck with me. So y'all already know I'ma fuck with y'all. And we on our way to 10K, man. Let's get to this 10K. I have a big giveaway I will be doing for y'all at 10K. So y'all already know what it is. But enough of me talking. Y'all already know what the video say. We better go ahead and start this documentary. Uh Trap Lord. Y'all already know who he is. He does these long documentaries. Hope I do not get copyrighted for this video. If I do, this video will not be going out. If I don't, y'all will see this video. Come on, everybody go to Trap Lord and tell them, let me do this video, let me do this video. Hopefully he do not, you know, you know, hit my video with a copyright or nothing like that. And I will definitely appreciate everything. And y'all can go over there and see the full video. I will be doing this step by step by step. So y'all like this video, hit that subscribe button. Let me know. That shows me that y'all like it. The views show me too, but it shows me that y'all like it when y'all hit that subscribe button that's that mean y'all coming over here y'all want to continue to sleep more so hit that subscribe button so i know that y'all want to see more but let's get right into it nba young boy yeah i've been i've been in my nba young boy for the one for the one time y'all been putting me up on you know all the little you know music i still got my list right here i got a couple more parts that i will be doing you know i'm still trying to do the 10 for 10 y'all got to give me them bangers but i'm still trying to do 10 for 10 but i really been on my NBA Young Boy bag for the longest, like, and I never listened to him, and I, I genuinely never listened to him. And until y'all been giving me bangers, y'all y'all been giving me some bangers. A lot of y'all been giving me some some mid. I gotta say, I gotta get some mid. But this made me go down my rabbit hole of listening to NBA Young Boy, and I'm the type of person where I get into my rappers, I get into the people, I get into them on and off the court. You know what I mean? On and off the bat. So I kind of wanted to know more about NBA Young Boy. Y'all see my previous other videos when i went into like what was the beef about with devon because i do know the beef that they had you know what i mean i do i, I did listen to dirk and stuff like that but so I, I did understand the beef but i didn't understand why it happened or, or what was the point so i did do that video trap lord got the whole breakdown so we better go ahead and jump right into you know his documentary and hopefully we get some insight i get some insight into what's really been going on Y'all like, comment, subscribe, man. Y'all already know what's going on. Let's get right to this video. Let's get it. ...is to provide an educational account of historical events in the mainstream music industry. No disrespect is intended. This video does not intend to glorify or glamorize the gang lifestyle. Every effort has been made to remove anything from this video that goes against YouTube's community guidelines, including swearing and violence. But if you'd like to see a fully uncut version of this video... Y'all go to his I channel, man. ...you on YouTube then head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross where you can watch all of my biggest documentaries uncut for just two bucks. But if Go you're not support. into that, Go just support. hit the subscribe button and enjoy the rest of the video. Thank you. Over the last five years, there's been few rappers that have generated as much excitement and controversy as Youngboy. His music is personal, thought-provoking, and violent 
in equal measure. Y'all been telling me that and I've been listening. He's top the Billboard charts with music all about killing, death and destruction. But his ability to communicate the stark realities of life growing up in the dangerous slums of Baton Rouge have inspired people all over America and the world at large. Youngboy's experiences in the gang-infested slums of Louisiana, where it's kill or be killed, inspired a generation of downtrodden youngsters to struggle through the pain too. Because despite losing family members and being the target of numerous assassination attempts, Youngboy has always managed to come out on top. Not just surviving, but beating the odds and coming back bigger every single time. It's rare to find an artist who attracts this much love and hate all at the same time. And Youngboy's thugged out survival anthems for the streets have made him one of the most beloved artists in history. But his influence has a dark side too. Because some might say that his aggressive murder anthems are inspiring a generation of lost teenagers to slide and resort to violence just like he had to. But can Youngboy really be blamed? When basketball player Ja Morant ended up in hot water for flashing a gun in a strip club to Youngboy's music, many people suggested that this was Youngboy's fault. And considering just how many lives seem to have been lost as a direct result of Youngboy's career, whether it's the murder of rival Baton Rouge rapper G Money, to the slaying of Youngboy's beloved manager Big Dump, or even the killing of Chicago rap legend King Von. Okay, so Big Dump was his manager. I, okay, I didn't know that. Y'all know I just re reacted to uh, the, the song about Big Dump. I didn't know that was his manager. I, I For some reason, I thought that was like a family member or, or like a brother or something, but that's his manager. Okay. Self-defense shooting, the result of Von trying to fight one of Youngboy's friends, to say Youngboy and his NBA crew are dangerous would be an understatement. But is the group of people that Youngboy surrounds himself a gang of loose cannons shooting first and asking questions later, or are they just really a family of youngsters with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that they would put their lives on the line to protect? Over the course of his career, so many people have died that Youngboy even refers to himself as the murder man, and claiming in numerous songs to have been the direct cause of as many as seven murders in his hometown. Over the years, many people have questioned the authenticity of Youngboy's gangster image. You got cap in your raps. Youngboy talking about on this song, bro. In spite of all of the violence surrounding his career, in 2022, Youngboy had a change of heart, perhaps coming the result of reflecting on all of the destruction and pain that had been caused by his music career, or as a result of years of legal battles that have seen Youngboy endlessly confined to a cell or on house arrest. Ooh, that boy got plenty much shots, don't he? To stop the violence pledging in interviews to stop promoting murder and violence in his songs, and even taking steps to de-escalate the conflict with his most hated rivals in Baton Rouge. With Youngboy's crew even sharing the stage with their mortal enemy Fredo Bang for a special charity concert aiming to stop mortal the Mortal enemy? Fredo Bang and NBA Youngboy mortal, mortal enemies? Ah, oh, see, look. He might, he might touch on that in his, in his, he might touch on this in, uh, in his documentary, but... Now I got to go look into that, bro, because I know a few Fred Fredo Bang songs, bro. Like, they're enemies. I never knew they was enemies. I knew they was from the same place, but wow, there's a lot of shit I don't know. God damn. Yeah, I got to I gotta watch the video on that, bro. I did not know they was enemies. That said, even these intentions have been called into question, when after pledging to stop the violence, Youngboy continues to drop violent murder anthems back to back. So the $50 million question remains unanswered. Is Youngboy really a grave digger? The self-proclaimed murder man of Baton Rouge really serious about stopping the violence? Or is this all just a ploy to try and avoid the responsibility for convincing a generation of teenagers to pick up a gun and get active in the streets? Well, today we're going to take a closer look at the murders, the music, and the man, and decide once and for all, is Youngboy really as dangerous as they say he is? Man, shout out to Trap Lower, man. Is he though? You gonna die? back to the state. But despite these improvements, however, Louisiana still remained a difficult place to grow up black through the 90s and the noughties. The state's incarceration rates have been at the very top in the world for decades now. And although black people are a minority in the state of Louisiana, the majority of the population in correctional facilities have been black. Louisiana has the second highest poverty rate in America, and here too, black people seem to suffer the worst. Moreover, the devastating events of Hurricane Katrina and subsequent flooding left tens of thousands of Louisiana residents stranded, with those affected being disproportionately African American. And the poor efforts to rescue these black people in danger had many people questioning if the state really even cared about their black citizens. George Damn. Bush doesn't care about black people. 
Now look, you might be wondering, what the hell is all of this happening? <laughs> I remember that. Well, in my opinion, <laughs> he was, it's man. important to understand the history of where he comes from, to understand the environment that created the man, as well as the inherent challenges of growing up as a young black man in Louisiana. But that said, there's also plenty of positive influences stemming from young boy's Louisiana upbringing. Despite the state's difficult history when it comes to slavery and civil rights, over the years, the state's multiculturalism would become an asset, spawning creative and artistic communities. Louisiana has a long and rich history when it comes to music. In the early 1800s, the influx of enslaved Africans brought with them a diverse array of musical traditions and talents. Musical traditions which merged with the existing French, Spanish, and Native American influences in Louisiana. The fusion of these diverse cultural elements led to the birth of unique musical styles such as Creole music and jazz. And then, during the Civil War, music would play a significant role in both the North and the South. In Louisiana, Confederate songs and abolitionist tunes were composed, reflecting the region's divided sentiments on the issue. Some people wanted slavery to end, and their ops wanted it to continue. And you could probably argue that these might represent some of the earliest examples of diss songs, with soldiers on both sides of the Civil War actually playing music that would hype up their troops and boost morale to prepare them for battle. After the Civil War, as time would go on, Louisiana creatives would continue to experiment with music. Blues music is believed to have originated in the Deep South in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The African American communities in New Orleans are credited with pioneering jazz music in the early 1910s, and in the 1950s, more new musical genres emerged, like Swamp Pop, where young Cajuns and Creoles would combine traditional French Louisiana music with New Orleans-style rhythm and blues and country and western music, as well as the more low-tempo Swamp Blues originating in the black communities of southwest Louisiana. Into the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement would further impact Louisiana's music scene, as African American musicians leveraged their talents to amplify the call for racial equality, often using their platforms to shed light on the struggles that they had faced. R&B and soul music with their origins in gospel and blues would become vehicles for expressing the aspirations of the African American community. And then of course, as hip hop emerged in the 80s and boomed through the 90s, a whole wave of aspirational southern rappers would emerge from Louisiana's biggest city. This be go hard. Oh, oh, oh. Modern rap was pioneered <laughs> by Master P oh, no. and Limit Click, later being taken to brave new heights in hip hop's bling era by the likes of Cash Money Records. <laughs> I wish the motherfucker would. And I would hit him with his mother. And arguably go on to and while the flashy antics of bling rappers might come across to some as tasteless, others would be inspired by these emerging black role models who were showing the world through artistry that a persecuted black man in the deep south could become <laughs> a multi-millionaire and build generational wealth off my nigga Wayne. their lived experience through music. Now things did it, still are perfect, but the success of rap music you in the South daddy. represents a triumph over <laughs> repression to me. And I'm telling you all of this buddy. because all of this history is very important context. Because the social circumstances that persisted in Louisiana over hundreds of years all led up to a single moment in time, where the perfect circumstances existed to create one of the modern day's most exciting and controversial music artists. People in Louisiana have been using their music to express their pain and tell their perspective on life for hundreds of years. And in the modern day Louisiana, one voice stands out above all others. The voice of a young boy who experienced one of the harshest upbringings modern day Louisiana had to offer. And that young boy was able to put all of his pain, trauma, and triumphs into his music. Modern day music that is still unmistakably Southern. So now you know the city, let's take a closer look at that young boy, young boy. Young boy was born Kentrell Deshaun Gordon in 1999. And over the years, he's been known by many names. NBA Youngboy, Youngboy Never Broke Again, Top, YB, AI Youngboy, and the list goes on. Now, Youngboy by no means had it easy as a kid. He grew up on the north side of Baton Rouge, more specifically North 38th Street and Chippewa Street. This led to another nickname that appears frequently in Youngboy's songs and albums, 38 Baby. In fact, Youngboy's legendary lyrics about 38th and Chippewa where he grew up has even attracted super fans who would film themselves driving down the very streets that Youngboy would play on as a child. But life on 38th Street was not kind to a young Youngboy. His father, Jeffrey Staden, wasn't in his life growing up as he had apparently been sentenced to 55 years in jail when uh, Youngboy was just eight years old. This geez. monster sentence was punishment for the armed robbery of a Baton Rouge convenience store on December the 1st, 2009. Youngboy's father, along with three other men, one of whom was his brother Dallas, had apparently robbed Albie's convenience store on North Sherwood Forest. The robbery got ugly, 
and young boy's father shot a store clerk in the leg during this altercation. This would earn him charges of armed robbery and attempted first degree murder. He would plead 55 years for getting shot in the leg? Damn, folks must have had a horrible lawyer, folks. Damn. How you get, what? That doesn't make sense. In trial, the state would find him guilty as charged on two counts, getting himself 10 years for the robbery and 50 years for the attempted murder. Shit. Many years later, Youngboy would even reference his father's incarceration, rapping on the song Cross Me that it was actually his uncle, his father's brother, that was there for the robbery, who snitched and got him 55 years in jail. Wow. Damn. I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure when you shoot somebody that's attempted murder. So regardless if you shot him in the leg or not. But damn, that's come on, man. Fifty five you ain't even murk nobody. You got fifty five years, bro. Bro, that's crazy. That's crazy, bro. Referencing his father's plight on the song Where the Love At, where he raps that he prays he doesn't become an alcoholic like his father, as well as paying respects and suggesting that his father needs a second chance at life because robbing people for their money was how he was trying to provide for his family. It seemed like both sides of young boy's family had a history of robbery, as his uncle on his mother's side was also an alleged known robber in Baton Rouge. However, unfortunately, he would suffer a worse fate than young boy's father. Andy Golden, the uncle who young boy referenced a couple of times in his music, was apparently shot in the head during a robbery attempt. Youngboy mentions on the track Acquittal how he heard stories about how his uncle was shot in the head, implying that their relationship was most likely non-existent if Youngboy had to rely on stories to hear all about his life. As well as in the track R.I.P. Lil Dave, when Youngboy speaks of his uncle who got shot in the head and died while hitting a lick. Further references to this are heard on the track 38 Baby, when Youngboy outright declares that Andy Golden was his uncle which means that robbery is in his genes. I mean, just take a second to think about the situation that young boy was dealing with here as a child. Damn. His father is serving 55 years for robbery with one uncle who snitched on him and his other uncle was also a prolific robber who got shot in the head and killed during a robbery. All this would leave him as a lost child with no father figure who even saw robbery as part of his DNA. That's right. a heavy situation Bro, for an eight year old to see, kid to see dealing. some, And with no father figure in his life. To see some bad shit as in your DNA, bro. That's crazy, bro. Like, you know, some niggas grow up and just feel like they can change their way of thinking or whatever. But to be young and just be like, bro, I'm not even going to fight this shit. This shit in my DNA, folks. Like, damn, you, you know that nigga going down the wrong path. <laughs> Get out the way for sure. <laughs> folks ain't living the shit you got to say, folks. He, he think the shit is in his DNA. He not about to fight none of that shit. He ain't finna think about, man, maybe I get my life together and do something different. Hell no, nah, he think popping your ass, he's supposed to pop your ass. Man, you better go and get the fuck out that nigga way. <laughs> Hell no. Nah. Young boy would have to rely on the females in his family to look after him and make him a man. Despite his mother Sharonda Golden being alive, she apparently wasn't there for young boy at a child at all times. So, he would initially be raised by his loving grandmother, Alice Golden, but unfortunately, Youngboy's grandmother would pass away too, leaving him devastated for years to come. Damn. Youngboy would open up about the loss of his grandmother in a Billboard interview in 2023, calling her his protector. After losing his grandmother, with his father in jail and his mother out of the picture, Youngboy wound up in a group home, and it would be here that he would be subject to physical abuse and bullying. He would later explain in a Billboard interview that it was this experience of being targeted in the group home that led him to cultivate his own dark and violent side for protection. Clearly, young boy had to fight for survival as a child. In fact, he actually broke his neck whilst he was wrestling as a toddler. This was a serious injury which required him to wear a full neck and head brace whilst his spine healed. This was a corrective procedure which left him with the three iconic head scars that he has on his head to this day. An everyday reminder on his face of just one painful incident that he endured as a child. And something Damn. his enemies are still quick to use against him with the hurtful moniker Dent Head often being levied against him. Youngboy had gone through so many traumatic experiences as a child, it's unsurprising that he would grow up dealing with a lot of pain. But even outside of the tragedies in his own family... Bro, Youngboy I never so knew that, bro. I'm thinking he must have bust his head as a kid, I don't know, must have got shot or something. I never knew that he broke his neck wrestling as a kid. You know how many times we didn't wrestle? Bro, I didn't jump off shit. <sighs> as kids, you don't know what's dangerous, bro. We don't, we don't know the d word bro we don't know the other side of life bro we just think that life is life and we just fit to go 
hey, whatever. Like, we don't know about real significant shit, bro. When you a kid, you're not thinking about passing. You're not thinking about none of that. You just better go do some shit. You get hurt. You're like, I get hurt. You're not thinking like, oh, you better end your life. Like, that is crazy. And that's crazy, like, to think they had that shit on tight as hell where his head is dented, scarred, dented. Then you must, they must have strapped that shit on tight as hell, folks. I would have sued them. Look at my fucking head, folks. Like, hell no. Nah. That shit would have, hell, I would have got a few dollars out of that. Outside the home, when he was just age 10, he would end up losing one of his closest childhood friends to gun violence. As a child, young boy was friends with another boy who was around six years older than him, a boy by the name of David Cobb, aka Lil Dave. On March the 27th, 2010, a memorial picnic was being held at a park on Woodpecker Street in Scotlandville in Baton Rouge. This event was intended to honor the memory of local teens who had lost their lives to gun violence. But unfortunately, the very thing that this event was intending to shed a light on would end up happening that same day. Because at some point, a fight broke out and bullets started flying. One of those bullets hit 16-year-old David Cobb in the spine, and despite there being hundreds of witnesses, this case would ultimately go on unsolved. Partly due to a fear in the community of retaliation against those who would be seen as a snitch for speaking to law enforcement. As a result, the family of Lil Dave would be left grieving without closure. Heartbroken that their child lost his life at an event that was intended to honor teens losing their lives to gun violence. And it wasn't just Dave's family who were devastated by this loss. Youngboy himself would be distraught and traumatized by losing a friend to gun violence so young. He would go on to rap about the loss of Lil Dave and the effect that it had on him years later. Youngboy would rap on the song For Keeps with Rich the Kid that Dave was killed by a chopper or machine gun and that he wishes he could call him. Also, on the aptly named song Homicide, Youngboy expresses his desire to get revenge and kill the person who took- Hold on, wait, 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 hold on. Hold on, bro. Gun violence, and it wasn't just- Hold on, let's go, let's kind of go back right quick. Dave, on March the 27th, 2010, a memorial picnic was being held at a park on Woodpecker Street in Scotlandville in Baton Rouge. This that didn't event make was sense. intended Hold to on. honor the memory of local teens who had lost their lives to gun violence. But unfortunately, the very thing that this event was intending to shed a light on would end up happening that same day. Because at some point, a fight broke out and bullets started flying. One of those bullets hit 16-year-old David Cobb in the spine, and despite there being hundreds of witnesses, this case would ultimately go on unsolved partly due to a fear in the community of retaliation against those who would be seen as a snitch for speaking to law enforcement. As a result, the family of Lil Dave would be- I don't know, 93 to 2010, that's 16? I don't know why I'm tripping, bro. Like, let me see, like, that's, yeah, that's 2010, like that. Oh yeah, that is 16, I'm tripping, I'm tripping, tripping, my bad, my bad. I'm, I thought they had the, the date wrong on the, on the thing. I'm like, bro, 2010? Like, an event that was intended to honor teens losing their lives to gun violence. And it wasn't just Dave's family who were devastated by this loss. Youngboy himself would be distraught and traumatized by losing a friend to gun violence so young. He would go on to rap about the loss of Lil Dave and the effect that it had on him years later. Youngboy would rap on the song For Keeps with Rich the Kid that Dave was killed by a chopper or machine gun and that he wishes he could call him. Also, on the aptly named song Homicide, Youngboy expresses his desire to get revenge and kill the person who took Dave's life, as well as saying that he knows Lil Dave is still with him on the song Poor One. On the song Cage Feeling, Youngboy speaks about the death of Lil Dave, saying that this loss turned his heart cold and made him become a killer. The fact that Youngboy was no stranger to loss of friends and family at such a young age just goes to show you the kind of environment. I've been saying, okay, I, I understand NBA Youngboy has lost a lot of people right now. I really need to figure out, like, who did he physically like you know you know what i mean like with his own hands because i'm i'm new to this i i i don't know who he physically like you know you know with his with his, his own hands i always heard people around him but i guess we better we better hear so damn it just you know we all go through shits but it, it just depending on how you how you go about it how you see it it's just like man what can, what can you expect? A motherfucker just seeing shit happen bad, 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 bad. You got to have a tough soul to go through all that shit and still try not to be that type. But you can't you can't get mad at the people who it's always something. And, 
you know, they go down this road, man. ...was growing up in, and the factors that coerced him into the kind of lifestyle he would go on to live. But Youngboy was already being influenced by the streets. He would actually later rap in the song Life that Lil Dave was the person who taught him how to smoke, shoot dice, and get money for sneakers. He also said that he felt life began getting crazy for him when Lil Dave was killed. In the song Better Man, Youngboy would claim to be tormented by the image of Lil Dave's murder in his mind, and on the track How I'm Living, he would vow to make the people responsible bleed for what they did to Dave. Later on, on the unreleased track Hold 13, that appeared only in a trailer for his hit album Top, Youngboy would rap a lyric which some believe is him actually confessing that when he made his first $20,000, he spent it on a hitman to get revenge on Lil Dave's killer. With this traumatic and personal loss, combined with his family's reputation when it came to robberies, it's no surprise then that as a young teenager, Youngboy dropped out of school in the ninth grade and got heavily involved in the streets, becoming a teenage robber just like his father and uncle. Youngboy would later tell DJ Smalls Eyes in an interview that after his grandmother died, he started robbing himself and ultimately wound up in jail for a robbery at just age 14. I grew up taking, I grew up taking, I grew up stealing, taking from people. It's like, well, at first, my grandma, my grandma used to take care of me. And when my grandma died, the started catching my attention at a younger age. See, I got, I book, I got booked for robbery on um, my age. 14, 14, 14. Ultimately, Youngboy found himself in a youth detention center for this robbery, but perhaps this would be a blessing in disguise, as while he was incarcerated, he would claim to have found his purpose in life, beginning to write music and using that as a way to express himself and cope with the pains of life, vowing to become an artist rather than a criminal. I ain't gonna say it was the best thing that happened to me. It helped me know my purpose. It helped me know what I wanna do. Within them six months, I wrote at least like 25, 25 songs with no beat. It was basically what I was going through, how I was feeling. It helped me learn how to express myself. Young Bro. boy's family were actually all Seeing him this young is crazy. Bro was young as hell, bro. Damn. Now, now I see why some of y'all people are like real big fans, bro. Y'all have been with this man since he was a child, bro. Y'all have been listening to NBA Young Boy. Hey. Those y'all are y'all are the perfect fans, bro. Cause a lot of fans don't stick with their artists that long, bro. Y'all now I see why y'all love this man so much, but y'all been with him since a kid, bro. Like this dude is grown. Now that's crazy. Seeing how young and innocent he looked, he it just seemed like he was in the wrong situation, but it worked out for him. Shit, he rich as hell. He's interested in music. Youngboy claimed to have written his own obscene rap lyrics in the fourth grade and he had apparently been taken to the studio by his mother, who herself was also an aspiring rapper. And his father had even written to him from jail, telling him that he had been writing music during his 55-year sentence and encouraging Youngboy to focus on music too. So, upon his release from jail for robbery, Youngboy would return to 38th Street with little more than just a dream of becoming a rapper along with a lifetime of trauma. And before he could get anywhere with his rap career, he would at least need a stable environment to live in. Luckily, he ended up finding a new place in the neighborhood to call home, with Youngboy rapping on the song Life that he met his friend 3-3 riding his bike down Chippewa and that 3-3's mother accepted him into their home like family. According to 3-3, him and Youngboy are essentially brothers as the two grew up with the same mother, Monique. But Monique is really 3-3's biological mother as we know that Youngboy is the biological son of Sharonda Golden. But due to the fact that 3-3's mother Monique helped raise Youngboy, he often refers to her as his mother as well, which would make 3-3 his adopted brother and the two do seem to have a relationship that is stronger than most real brothers. And because of this, the two basically just say they're real brothers. You said you knew him since you were four? Since when? Because you guys are like brothers and, and you, yeah. were, you were born around each other, yeah. so it's like you don't have any memories of it's not like, knowing them. No, it's like, it's like you know how, how both our, our dad is, a, you know, split up, you know what I'm saying? So we got the same moms. It's okay. like, Man, really, I started making music with my brother. Just really inspired me to go in the booth because it really wasn't about me. It was really about young boy, and I was pushing him. And he, one day he just told me, man, look, come do this with me. And he pushed me to go in the booth, and I just took it a liking into it. And, you know, that's where it really started from. So, you know, shout out YB. Meanwhile, Youngboy's relationship with his own biological mother, Sharonda, was up and down during his childhood. Years down the line, he would open up about this on the song Lonely Child from his October 2019 project, AI Youngboy 2, when he says that even though he called 3-3's mother Monique his adopted mother, he still needs Sharonda in his life. Perhaps due to the lack of a real father figure growing up meant that he had to rely on both of his mothers for emotional and mental support. Wow. But anyway, after getting out- Wow, man. 
that's crazy how you can like you learn so much shit. Like I did not know none of this about Emmy Young Boy, bro. None of this. Like I just always thought his mom was there. I always thought like like certain shit that you could just see like from the internet, bro. Like it's it's never judge a book by its cover. Like you just you just think that people be there your whole life and it's just I know he deal with it his own way, but it's crazy how how people can just come back around when 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 you're up. Like money rules everything, bro. Like I just feel like why why don't people want to show that love? Why don't people want to be there when just because that's you know what I mean? Because you love them, like it's like oh, once the money and all this other stuff, it's like now I can make time to be around you, or whatever. And I don't and I don't you know know they situation or anything like that but it just seemed like that happens a lot in our community like our parents our family members uh, just leave us to die and once we figure out this life and we get a little money so-called in our pockets that's when family come back to kind of show you that love like like why can i have this without this so-called money but it's, it's just mo- this money shit not really real bro like, Money, like, bro, all it is is paper, bro. Like, people will not have the time and they won't answer the phone calls, won't do none of that shit. When money involved, bro, they they sit there and watch the phone the whole day, like, wait for you to call. They will be there. They will they will give your whole life. People will be like, bro, I'll kill for you. I'll do all this stuff for you. Just because you make money. Like, if you was broke, they, they, they'll look at you. Get, get the fuck away from me. Ugh, go get out my house. Get out. Like, that's. I never understood. I can never understand that when it comes down to how this world works, bro. And finding a new safe space to call home, Youngboy's new spiritual brother, 3-3, would be supportive of his aspirations as a rapper. And together, this brotherly duo would get back to finessing on the streets to pay for studio time. Eventually, with Youngboy getting enough recording time in to produce a full-length musical project. And by April the 10th, 2015, Youngboy had released his first ever mixtape, Life Before Fame. This tape featured tracks like Homicide and Range Rover, which showed a 15-year-old Youngboy truly had the skills to pay the bills early on. The album begins with an intro where Youngboy mentions an affiliate of his named D-Dog catching a body. This sets the mood for the rest of the album, letting fans know straight away that Youngboy had ties with the streets, despite the fact that he was technically still a child at this point. And in the same song, he gives us an insight into his torturous relationships and the reason behind why he finds it so hard to remain faithful to his partners even at age 15. In the song I Know, Youngboy begins to paint a menacing picture of his position in the local gang hierarchy, mentioning on two occasions how he can rely on another known NBA affiliate by the name of Lil Pap to go get him. A brash statement which shows that even at age 15, Youngboy was really in the streets with people around him that he could send to do dirty work. Youngboy would also share his experience with Get Back and Vengeance in this project. On the track Deal With It, he talks about how revenge was exacted on the person who killed his uncle, saying that they spotted the person who killed his uncle and that Youngboy witnessed somebody put that person in a casket, and going on to say that the deceased man's brother is now after him. This is an important lyric, as it shows that even back when he was just 15 years old, people were dying around Youngboy, being killed, and he was becoming a target himself, despite not being directly responsible for the violence that had played out. Elsewhere on this song, Youngboy pledges his allegiance to a group called TBG, or Top Boy Gorilla. This is the first crew or record label that Youngboy aligned himself with when he became a rapper. Though unfortunately, as is often the case in the streets, over time, as Youngboy's star rose, tension would brew between the members of TBG, arguing over who the next big rapper from the group would be. And eventually, what begun as a partnership would devolve into a deadly beef, with members of TBG picking their sides, and the feud escalating into an all-out gang war, with people being murdered on both sides, and years of heartbreak playing out on the streets and the music. When Youngboy left juvenile detention, inspired to become a rapper rather than a robber, it wouldn't take long for others to see the potential that this teenage rap prodigy had. From here, a group of people from his neighborhood, with ties to the music industry, as well as the streets, would begin to take him under their wig. Youngboy's first mixtape, Life Before Fame, was actually released under the banner of TBG, with Youngboy and 3-3 being seen in throwback pictures rocking TBG merch. TBG stands for Top Boy Gorilla, a crew with a storied history in the wild and dangerous streets of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. TBG was supposedly started by deceased Louisiana native and affiliate of rap veteran Boosie, Little Ivy Smith. He would turn out to be the uncle of future TBG rap prospect, Lit Yoshi, but more on him later. 
Now, Lil Ivy was sadly killed in an unsolved triple homicide back in 2005. However, at this early stage in the game, Youngboy was nothing more than a promising young prospect to these Baton Rouge rap OGs. The older members of TBG were looking to find the next up-and-coming rap rookie who could potentially be the next homegrown rap star to come out of Baton Rouge. And at the time, the real crown jewels of the TBG squad were a couple of rappers known as G Money and Fredo Bang, who around the time were picking up steam with their song iPhone 6 alongside Boulevard Mel and YMM captain. You can tell that Youngboy was truly close with the TBG crew at this point because Youngboy even appeared in the background of the iPhone 6 music video, at one point handing a Gucci bag to Fredo Bang, a moment that would honestly be inconceivable in what would later become a deadly and bitter beef. As the story goes, the TBG crew had ties to Baton Rouge's criminal underworld, and rappers and affiliates of the TBG crew were still involved in the local drug trade. Unfortunately, soon some of this street beef would end up souring things on the music side because the TBG crew supposedly had a beef going with another Baton Rouge crew called BBG, or Bottom Boy Gorillas. Gang, crew, clique, record label, call them whatever you want, but BBG and TBG were bitter enemies. With a big rumor at one point going around that Youngboy's cousin Boozilla, who was affiliated with BBG, ended up in a bitter disagreement with G-Money from TBG. Now, there's been intense speculation over the years as to what was the exact cause of this beef. Some have suggested that Boozilla ran off with money or drugs from G-Money, whilst others suggest that the whole drama was actually over a woman. Another explanation even suggests that it was actually young boy Always some who stole money from dusty G-Money, ass but women. actually blamed the finesse on his cousin Boozilla, as Boozilla was seen on Twitter disavowing his own family at one point and G-Money seemingly indicating that this rumor was true on his diss track Industry, where he claimed that Youngboy had him looking for Boozilla with a gun and saying that Boozilla actually wanted to kill Youngboy over this whole situation. There's even an old clip circulating that showed Boozilla and BBG affiliate Baby Joe seemingly posted up with guns looking for Youngboy and saying FNBA. This was unusual because previously Boozilla had claimed to be a member of the group NBA and even at one point referred to himself as NBA Boosie. Now, I'll explain to you what NBA means in a minute, but just bear with me. Because meanwhile, as that personal beef was developing, another more professional beef was emerging between Youngboy and the TBG crew. According to some, at a certain point Youngboy got frustrated with the TBG label. This was likely due to the fact that he wasn't necessarily getting the money or shine that he thought he deserved from the crew with their main focus being on building the careers of G-Money and Fredo Bang rather than investing in Youngboy. So at some point, Youngboy and 3-3 would leave TBG, starting their own crew. Initially, 3-3 and Youngboy wanted a group based on Youngboy's initials, Kentrell Golden or KG. Since KG also means kilograms, the initial idea was to call their crew Weight Gang, another reference to the drug game. At first his name was like KG, but then we got like, that's where the Weight Gang come from. But What did KG like, stand for? Like, his initials, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's his name, but right. Weight Gang was one of the first things he had came up with. But clearly that name wasn't really hitting the spot. So later on, a few of the members of this crew were just chilling, sitting on their porch, when Youngboy apparently vowed that he was not trying to go broke no more, to which other members of the crew agreed the same thing, with this pledge giving the crew inspiration to name themselves Never Broke Again, or NBA. Like when we was on the porch one day, it was like, we ain't trying to go broke no more, and then, he was like, I ain't, I ain't trying to go broke knees, so we never broke again. Like, you know what I'm saying? From day one, that's where NBA started from, like. So the NBA crew was born, naturally taking some inspiration from the National Basketball Association. They would even make their logo the Jumpman, the iconic logo affiliated with basketball legend Michael Jordan dunking the basketball. But for Never Broke Again, their version would be a man jumping up in the air, holding a pistol. Oh and always NBA God. crew wanted to go from- <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Niggas is not re creative at all, bro. You should have put that nigga in a Nike Tech. Shit. <laughs> the fuck? Y'all should have put a nigga in a Nike Tech. Bro, that would have been a, a nice fucking symbol. Shit, that's what niggas be rocking. Dude, bro, niggas is not creative. Come on now. The jump man was with the with the with the buzz cut with a pistol, folks. <laughs> Oh shit, bro! Hey, you gotta give it to him, bro. <laughs> like what, bro? So toting stick up kids to music industry heavy hitters being paid as much as professional basketball players. Now, whether or not you like the name, there was no denying that the meaning behind it was powerful. And together, the Never Broke Again crew rallied around Youngboy, vowing to do whatever it took to take him to the top. 
and make sure that they as a group never go broke again. So before we dive any deeper into the goings on of the Never Broke Again crew, let's just take a quick look at some of the main members of that collective so that you can follow everything that's about to go down in this long and complicated story. Young Boy is of course the face of Never Broke Again, the NBA collective, he is the label's leading rapper. And this crew's bet on getting behind Young Boy's career would ultimately end up paying off handsomely. And with his crew's support, he would go on to become one of the biggest artists in the entire world. Then there's OG33, NBA's co-founder who started the group along with Young Boy and Montana. I started NBA, you know, like, it was then like Young Boy just was really like the main one who was rapping, like I don't really like, I don't really take rapping serious because, like, Youngboy really made me rap. After 3 Three's mother took Youngboy in as one of her own, they would build a bond as strong as blood brothers. We got the same mom. Okay. Like, like that. OG33 is one of ten children, five kids from his mother's side, five from his father's side. But he's the oldest of all of them, which has led to him having a mature outlook and a real head on his shoulders, as he's almost had to act like a father figure for Youngboy and his other siblings. And there's ten kids all together, right? Yeah. Five from your mom yeah, and five, five from your dad. dad. Yeah. <laughs> On both sides, I'm close with all my brothers and sisters because I'm the oldest, so it's just like... You're yeah, almost man. like a father figure, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Is that a lot of responsibility? Yeah. Yeah, for sure, but you know, that's just my role. So it's just, I took on my role. When Youngboy didn't really want to rap at first, it was 3-3 that pushed him and made sure that he stuck with it, dedicating his life to elevating Youngboy's career and keeping him on the right path. I always was the one that always pushed him, like, because he didn't really want rap at first, but then, like, once I really found out, like, he was going to be that, like, I pushed him even more, more, harder, harder. Hmm. Like, I was getting a thought, like, I went back to, like, record companies was doing, like, I was getting a thousand CDs printed up, like, man, I, I didn't get them thousand CDs and really passed them out, like, just the man of a minute, like, this, that. It's three who pulls the strings and make the moves behind the scenes keeping the ship sailing smoothly and ensuring that the NBA collective runs efficiently and profitably. He apparently would manage the business side of things, sometimes writing contracts or putting shows together. I was more on the, like the business and management, like writing contracts and, you know, putting shows together for him. Like when we first started off, I was doing really everything, you know. And Youngboy apparently even inspired OG3 to start making his own music because before, 3 was just mainly focused on pushing Youngboy's career. If it wasn't for YB walking me into the booth, I wouldn't even be in the music because I was just mainly pushing him. It wasn't even about me. Now, 3-3 does enjoy rapping, but he's also a self-proclaimed CEO and business is apparently where his passion lies. My main focus is it wouldn't be a career. I wouldn't choose rap as a career because I am a CEO and I love my position. But 3 has also gained a cult following of his own from being the head honcho of the NBA crew. And considering the dark reputation that has followed Youngboy over the many deadly years of his career, this has led to many internet fanboys speculating on whether OG3 is the true mastermind behind the violence playing out in Baton Rouge. With many Reddit posts circulating, constantly speculating on how many deaths that 3-3 might be responsible for, even sometimes referring to him as the Grim Threeper. But it's unclear if that is just straight trolling. Because in reality, OG3 has always tried to look out and take care of Youngboy and keep him on the straight and narrow, acting as the voice of reason in his life. And that's my baby brother. I always look out for him. I always take care of him. But like, I don't... I don't ever expect him to do nothing bad, but he don't he do not do it intentionally. It might be on accident, but I always talk to him and enforce that, like, we shouldn't be doing a lot of things, and you know he listens. So it's like, I always was that type of person. Right. I always was that. Kind of like the voice of reason for when he gets a little hot-headed, you're like, so that'll yeah. help calm down. Cause he's probably yeah. listening to you and he ain't trying to listen to a lot of random people. Yeah, he ain't gonna listen to nobody, if ain't me. Then you've got Montana. According to a Billboard article profiling Youngboy, Kyle Montana Clybourne found Youngboy's music early on YouTube. And in the absence of a father figure or any real older male role model in his family, it seems like Montana assumed a kind of father figure role for Youngboy in the early stages of his life and career, giving him guidance on how to survive the gritty streets of North Baton Rouge. In fact, in the song Lonely Child from his October 2019 project AI Youngboy 2, Youngboy admits that he has been missing his father, and as a result, he actually calls Montana his father. Montana would help co-found the Never Broke Again label along with Youngboy and 3-3, with interviews explaining that in the early days of NBA, Youngboy would be sleeping on an air mattress at Montana's house. 
at a time when Montana played the role of manager, booking agent, and financier, driving Youngboy all around the South to perform for between $500 and $1,500 a show to build his fan base in the early days. However, there's always been confusion over exactly who Youngboy's manager specifically is, and to be fair, it has changed over the years. For a period of time, Youngboy's manager was a man by the name of Big Dump. Sometimes referred to as Youngboy's manager or agent, it was Dump who was there for Youngboy during the most turbulent years of his come up. But Dump would ultimately end up losing his life in 2018, seemingly as a direct result of the deadly street beef between these two warring Baton Rouge gang sets. But we'll go much deeper into that situation later on in the story. Another yeah. person who played a significant role on the management side is someone called Fee Banks a Louisiana industry legend who had apparently helped Lil Wayne start Young Money and previously managed Kevin Gates. These people are the brains and administrators behind the NBA empire. And then, when it comes to the rapping side, we have a number of NBA members with a much closer proximity to the streets. Now, there's a lot of names that have been affiliated with this crew over the years, and this list is by no means a definitive list of everyone who has had something to do with NBA as a crew, so don't be offended if you got left off. But these are just some of the people who have played a major role in Youngboy's crew and who play a relevant role in today's story. I'm talking about people like NBA Ben 10. This is OG3's younger blood cousin and a day one NBA affiliate. Ben met Youngboy at Three's house, and apparently the two had a fight the first time that they met. Man, man, Three first cousins, blood. Like, we used to stay together. His mom and used to live together, so that's how I met Three. This uh, I met that n day at Three house. I met that n We had a fight. Same day, you heard me. But apparently after this fight, they would share a blunt and become good friends, going on to make money and catch cases together since they were just 12 years old. We spoke the blunt, you heard me. Yeah, I became part of the invader, same day. Just like How old y'all was like around that time? i say probably, probably from the turn 12 or 12. Ben has been a key part of the collective since day one with a huge presence on social media, particularly Instagram, where he would give exclusive insights and snippets into the world of Never Broke Again. Ten still posts regularly on Instagram despite his original account having been taken down, and he's even seen some recent success in his own right as a rapper, with songs such as Pain and Walking Dead amassing over 1 million views each. But he's also a loose cannon and not somebody to be messed with. He was seen on IG Live with Youngboy, Baby Joe, and other NBA members playing with guns, with Ben 10 letting off shots on IG Live, causing Baby Joe to duck for cover. BBG Baby Joe is another one of Youngboy's cousins, who despite his young age, has lived for a lot, including a bullet to the face. You know, sure. you guys were on the freeway, I think it was you and two friends, and uh, a car opened fire on you guys. We wouldn't even Walmart. Every my head went and got some, uh, some cake and ice cream for my baby for his birthday. When I walk out Walmart, I see this shit. Yeah. And then I, I, we didn't get, I, I didn't get shot on the interstate. I don't know where people get their information from. I just tried to light. We was at the light. And then it just, it just went like that. You know what I mean? Despite facing serious danger in the streets, Baby Joe has been aiming to make a name for himself in the music industry and make himself some legit. Man, money. all these His young men, dog. Iraq God damn, has over bro. 5 million views. And as a beloved member of the NBA crew, Joe's name often pops up in Youngboy's songs. And if these lyrics are anything to go by, it seems that Joe's relationship with the streets remains strong. Another key member of the crew is Michi Baby. Well known as Youngboy's raspy voiced big cousin, he's best known for his early 2000s style song Cutlass, as well as his 2020 track with Youngboy, Talk My a track which has amassed an impressive 47 million views at the time of recording. Youngboy has talked about hitting licks and doing burglaries with his older cousin Michi on numerous occasions in his lyrics, leading some listeners to think that it was perhaps Michi who had influenced Youngboy's involvement with the streets in his early life. Then of course you have Big B, who picked up a lot of attention for his fire verse on the NBA posse cut, That Gang, which picked up over 5 million views and also featured 3-3 and KD. Big B exhibits a more conventional rapping style compared to some other members of the NBA crew, with less laid-back melodies and catchy hooks, and more hard-hitting bars and punchy refrains delivered with aggressiveness and energy on the mic. There's NBA KD, he's known musically for his versatility and distinct flow, as well as a standout performance on the song That Gang. He also popped up with a verse on the song Extortion with Big B and 3-3, a track which got over 2 million views. His biggest solo track is the 2018 song When I Wake Up, and KD showed a lot of promise and potential in the early years of rap. Unfortunately, his momentum was derailed by a life-changing injury getting shot in 2019. Reportedly, after this incident, KD was confined to a wheelchair. However, there's been a lot of speculation uh, as to whether he was walking again. Damn. Damn, man. 
after a period of rehabilitation. Whilst that's not been confirmed, since the incident, he's remained firmly behind the scenes, but is a beloved member of NBA. Another major member of the crew is Herm the Black Sheep. Musically, fans appreciate Herm for his real and authentic lyrics and subject matter rather than his style or flow on the mic. And if the content of his lyrics are to be believed, he is certainly not one to be messed with. In the same vein, there's also Who Gang D, aka Lil D, or Scully. This is another cousin of Youngboy with a serious reputation in the streets and his own budding rap career, with his catchy double meaning titled song, Can't Go To Sleep, running up 1.6 million views at the time of this writing. Interestingly though, D wasn't even aware that he was Youngboy's cousin when they first became friends, apparently only finding out later through his mother and grandfather. I didn't know he was my, my cousin at first. Oh really? See, I was thugging with three okay. at first. And then my mama had texted me like, when I was with him for a whole month straight, with YB for a month, she had texted me, she was like, uh, she talked to my, my papa, and she had, and he told her that I had a cousin named maybe a young boy that rapped, you get what I'm saying? And she was like, for real, that's crazy, he already been hanging with him. He's apparently the survivor of a gunshot wound to the neck, with Youngboy having dropped numerous lyrics complimenting D as a reliable shooter, even going as far in the song Bring the Hook to label him a headshot specialist. This is a skill that D himself all but admitted in his Off the Porch interview. Uh, how'd you get the nickname Scully? <laughs> From this tattoo, I'm just saying like that. The gun, shooting the score. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Scully. He's got a promising rap career, a likable personality, and a big potential to be a star on the mic, if he can stay in trouble. You've also got Lil Pat, <laughs> Ben Ten's little brother These dudes, and some man. The NBA crew in the streets. Something else, Young I'm telling you. Youngboy mentioned him as being active in the streets in numerous songs, labeling him specifically as somebody who Youngboy can call on for certain favors. And he recently got five years for his apparent involvement in the murder of TBG rival rapper G Money, which we will discuss in detail shortly. There's also NBA Chopper Boy, a big man with a big range in his vocals, bringing a great singing voice to the mic that serves to provide a canvas for his dark and menacing lyrics. Then you've got Barber one of Youngboy's frequently referenced shooters. Like Pap, Baba, or Baba Osama, is mentioned quite a bit in some of Youngboy's most violent songs, with Youngboy even rapping on the track Carter's Son that he calls up Baba to get the guns and go and rob people for him. Now, Baba has a pretty extensive rap sheet demonstrating just how active he was in the streets, and he's currently locked up on murder charges. But these aren't your average murder charges. It's actually been reported that Baba Osama is facing a whopping nine counts of murder, with some Shit. recent posts on social media even suggesting that Baba Osama was actively working as a gang assassin or hitman, engaging in murder for hire for numerous gangs. Now that's not necessarily everybody that's been involved with <laughs> Youngboy's NBA crew over the years, but they are the people that we'll be talking about most extensively in today's story. Clearly, Youngboy's NBA crew are a group of young men coming out of some of the most difficult streets that the Deep South has to offer. Clearly, some of these guys aren't afraid to break the law and even kill to protect what's theirs. Whether that's their own lives, the lives of those around them, or the life of their top breadwinner, Youngboy. The NBA crew are truly willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that they indeed never go broke again. However, there's been a lot of confusion over the years, because as well as NBA, there's another group that Youngboy and other NBA members shout out a lot, and that's 4K Trey, or 4KT. It would appear that while Youngboy started his record label in the name NBA, or Never Broke Again, his affiliations to actual gangs in the streets of Baton Rouge goes by another name. Youngboy has dropped numerous lyrics where he claims to be a member of the gang 4K Trey, who sometimes refer to themselves as Slimes. He's also made numerous references to being in America's infamous blood gang. Now, slime is a decades-old term that has been associated over the years with Blood Gang members. This term was initially brought to the public's attention by Blood rapper Vado, who released numerous projects that would reference slime, with the usage of the blood slang slime and slat being popularized in mainstream modern rap music by Atlanta Blood rapper Young Thug, who is currently incarcerated awaiting trial for gang-affiliated charges. Now, this slime ideology essentially sees Blood members identifying under the colour green rather than the traditional red bandana that Blood members are known to wear. And as Youngboy got further into the music industry, he would seemingly build close relationships with other rappers who were known to affiliate with the Blood gang or identified as Slime. People like Birdman, 21 Savage, and Young Thug himself. And as the years went by, Youngboy would increasingly use his lyrics and music videos to shout out his affiliations to 4K Trey, the Blood gang, or Slimes. Even naming his Never Broke Again label compilation 
album Green Flag Activity, along with him and his crew frequently being seen in public with nothing but slime green bandanas and blue clothing. They would also sometimes refer to each other as Fours for 4K Trey. However, for the specific explanation of the gang's name, 4K Trey, this has been a mystery that has sparked debate amongst NBA fans for years. One popular theory is that it simply means Four Kentrell, and that his 4KT gang are killing or shooting specifically for Youngboy, or Kentrell. Another popular theory claims that 4KT actually stands for Forever Killing Them, a more general rallying cry against their ops. Other people think that 4KT actually relates to the names of Youngboy's first children, with the first four of their names beginning with K and one beginning with T, with this being a more vanilla interpretation of the gang's name, suggesting that 4KT is a way of Youngboy saying that he's essentially doing what he does for his children, whose initials are K and T. Another explanation circulates, suggesting that 4KT actually means for Crazy Trey. This is a reference to Crazy Trey, a young man from Baton Rouge who was gunned down at a party in 2014. He was apparently close friends with one of Youngboy's biggest enemies from Baton Rouge, Fredo Bang, a detail which has led many to suggest that this actually couldn't possibly be the true meaning of 4K Trey, with some outright denying this explanation, suggesting that Youngboy had not even yet associated with Fredo Bang at the time 4KT was founded. There's yet another theory that 4KT actually refers to Youngboy's cousin Boozilla, who was killed in 2016, as his real name was Keandre, with a suggestion that 4K Trey actually was originally 4K Dre, or Keandre, but the Dre over time ended up being changed to Trey. Now look, at this stage, it's unclear exactly what 4K Trey stands for, but in the end, perhaps we aren't supposed to know the real meaning. And right. the idea I that mean, the true they know the real of meaning. gang that Youngboy supposedly affiliates with being shrouded in secrecy kind of makes perfect sense. After all, Youngboy's artist Quan Rondo Rondo would even say in his song Way Up that he actually threw a girl out just for even asking what 4K Trey meant. Clearly it's a secret, and clearly I'm not supposed to know, which means you are definitely not supposed to know. Exactly. Now you know the city, the gangs, the label, and the people behind the music, let's take a closer look at the story, the incredible ups, the devastating downs, and the lessons to be learned from Youngboy's one-of-a-kind career and life journey. All right, man, we're going to go ahead and end it right there. We're going to wait for part two. Y'all like, comment, subscribe. We're going to be doing this whole thing in parts because it is long. I gave y'all a long video today. We're going to be going finishing with parts. You know, part two is going to be coming up. We just got to see if y'all inter interested in these, in these videos, man. Hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button so we can continuously do this documentary and, you know, knock it out. Other than that, like, comment, subscribe. More videos on the way. Hit that thumbs up. Let's get to 10K. If y'all watching this, hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Man, this 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 documentary is gonna be crazy, 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 crazy because it's a lot of shit that I didn't know about NBA Young Boy that he do that he did. This is gonna make my reactions a little bit different now. I'm still gonna react the normal way. I'm still gonna react. I'm still gonna rate the music the normal way. But now that I'm informed about a lot, it, it, it's going to be totally different. But other than that, more videos on the way. We're gone. Peace. Love y'all. Till the next one. Peace.